All right, I see we have quite a few participants. Uh, welcome everyone. And really great to see so many of you are here uh, to join into this webinar today. My name is Max Sichuan. I'm the Chief Growth Officer at Paperfly. And with me here today, I'm very pleased to have Chuck Cahoon and Sunny Mock from Forrester. And we're here to discuss both general trends within brand and digital asset management, but also, of course, the total economic impact report for Paperfly that we have been collaborating on. So Chuck is a principal analyst for Forrester, covering digital experience, applications, platforms, and services, including digital asset management systems. And Sunny Mock is a senior consultant with Forrester EMEA team and has been the lead analyst in compiling the total economic report that we'll have a look at later in the session today. So uh, just before we jump into Chuck and Sunny's presentations, I wanted to take the opportunity to quickly introduce Paperfly for those of you who don't know us that well yet. And to do this, I would like to start with uh, this slide here. Branding is uh, not just the name. And I think many of you in the audience today can really appreciate that. Uh, and the McKinsey study actually showed that strong brands generate on average 31% more revenue than the average company. And I think this again emphasizes just how much power a brand can have for both revenue generation and general company recognition, right? And as we can see on the examples to the right, uh, a brand value is not connected only to the name, but there is so much more that goes into really creating strong brand equity. So how can you make sure that you're able to leverage a strong brand into more revenue? Well, uh, I think you're all aware many companies understand the potential of this and spend a lot of time and money creating a brand and uh, cor correlating brand values, expecting those high returns. However, as many of you also know, maintaining that brand consistency and truly leveraging a brand's value becomes increasingly difficult, especially as organizations grow and becomes more distributed, right? So suddenly there is an arm's length distance between the brand owners understanding the value of the brand and the people working with the brand on an everyday basis. And this can lead to a few challenges. And one of these challenges I can actually attest to myself from my own experience, uh, and it relates to the challenges of rebrandings. Uh, I'm sure many of you know the assurance and consulting company EY. Uh, this was the official new logo and name that was launched in 2013. However, this was the logo used in the majority of presentations when I joined them in 2016. So it just goes to show that sometimes it's really hard to, to actually get the rebranding out and it's really tricky to manage properly, right? Uh, another common challenge in, in brand management is really related to localization of ads while staying brand compliant. And whether that is towards a customer or towards a potential recruit if you're working with employee, employee branding, uh, in this example here, uh, I'll show it to you here. This is McDonald's who was maybe not able to bring their localization all the way to the finish line. And they actually created some confusion in Bristol. As you can see, the sign reads from tube door to front door uh, with the tube referring to the underground train. Uh, the only problem was, which you can see in uh, this LinkedIn post, that Bristol actually doesn't have an underground. Right, so even McDonald's can do some errors when it comes to localization from time to time, and it just shows how tricky it is. Uh, and I think I could mention a lot more examples with regards to this, but, and I think you guys in the audience probably know a few as well, uh, but these challenges are really the reason why Paperfly exists. So we were created to find innovative and better ways to control brand identity, maintain consistency, and empower teams to create brand experiences in just the way they were intended to be delivered. We were founded in the early 2000s, and today, as you can see on the screen here, we have offices in eight countries, and this is really in order to be very close to our customers, helping them leverage the full benefits of our brand management software platform. So what does this platform do for you? Well, in, in brief, it provides a home for your brand, presenting both assets and brand guidelines in the best way possible to prepare everyone across your business to really champion your brand with an indisputable single point of truth. We also offer a digital asset management solution, and that helps you centralize and easily access your, all your digital assets to effectively organize your marketing collateral and govern uh, usage across all operations, local, localizations, and campaigns. 
And not only are we helping you to store and present brand assets, but we're also very proud of our leading template technology that allows you to create studio, sorry, I'm just gonna click there, that allows you to create studio uh, brand material always on brand. Uh, and you can do it in all different formats and without the need for any designer comp uh, competency. So this really significantly reduces time to market of branded content without having to rely on outside production agencies and without having to compromise on quality, which is very cool as well. Finally, we are also, of course, offering plan and collaboration tools that help your teams work more efficiently and also help you measure how well your organization is on top of your band game. So I think that was just a quick update from us on, on who Paperfly is as a company. And, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, very great brands that we are proud to call our partners. And we really, you know, it's important for us that we're able to support our customers in making sure that their brand comes to life in the best way possible. And uh, that's why also we're super proud to be able to partner with Forrester and finally be able to put a clear number on the value that our solution is creating for our customers, right? And the journey to this total economic impact report has been a valuable experience for us. And it has brought many important learnings and insights internally for us that we'll take with us. And we're also very happy to be able to share some of those insights with you here today. So with that being said, I think that's enough from my side. Uh, and I'm very happy to hand over to you, Chuck, now. And uh, Chuck is going to provide us with some overall insights on how digital asset management can be leveraged to improve brands and customer experiences and how you can benefit from those developments in your business. So with that said, uh, Chuck, the floor and screen is yours. Thank you, Max. Appreciate it. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Let me see if I can advance the slides here. Um... There we go. Um, let's run these back. So thanks for having us. Um, you know, I think there's really three aspects to what I wanted to start with, um, but it's really a continuum of a story um, that I wanna share with you this morning. Um, I wanna touch a little bit on customer experience. I wanna talk about brands. I wanna talk about personalization, context and delivery of that. But I want to talk about all of this in the lens of our consumers, because our consumers don't think about it in those different facets. So as we embark on this discussion, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is what is customer experience? Um, there's a lot of, you know, market trends. There's a lot of um, talk about it um, on various social media channels. But um, our research shows that customer experience is the perception of all the interactions that a consumer has with your brand. Um, let me just pause there for one minute and let's take a, take a step back and look at how fragile this description really is. It is about the perception of all the interactions that a consumer is having with your brand. Think about all of the touch points. I think, Max, your example of the localization piece in McDonald's was spot on. I mean, brands are touching consumers in all facets um, and in all aspects of their lives and their lifestyles. Um, and that's a little bit of what I want to discuss here as well this morning. So naturally, um, you know, as we start looking at customer experience, we're dealing with some amount of macroeconomic headwinds. Uh, Forrester did a lot of research towards the end of last year to think about, and through the surveys, to think about where is, you know, customer experience heading in general. And our research shows that 82% of customer experience leaders predicted, and this is from our data towards the end of 22 last year, that they expect their budgets to rise in technology, services, data research, and project-related expenses. Um, a very powerful statement on the promise of customer experience and market across channels, across mediums. As we start to think about this and we think about customer experience, we think we, we now have built the case that there is, you know, leaders do believe that they're going to invest more in customer experience. Now that we have established that the cost of doing nothing starts to become pretty high, really where is good customer experience and what does it feel like? Um, what does it look like to an end consumer? Is it this, is it a happy customer? Everybody wants to feel as happy as this child, right? When they have a great customer experience. 
Or is it what we've heard so often in market around brands that tell really good stories, right? What do brands do? They they envelop a consumer and they create an experience, especially through digital channels where consumers feel that they're part of that brand experience. Is this it? Or is it more about making sure that your customers are happy? Um, a quick uh, a quick story from my personal life um, that I'm sure many others have a lot of similar stories as well. Um, about five years ago, I purchased one of those um, electric, electric toothbrushes. Uh, it was a great digital experience. Oh man, they got me on social media and they got me good. I, uh, I, I was completely bought into the brand. I was, you know, no more cavities ever was their promise. I was sold. I purchased it every quarter. They sent me a new refill. They were kind enough to send me a battery with it to replace it in the electric toothbrush as well. I was singing hi till the day that the brush stopped working. And so you can imagine, I am, I'm feeling a little concerned as to what the experience is going to be like now. It's because I've bought into this brand, right? It's part of my lifestyle. And so I, I remember distinctively, I uh, went onto the website. Um, as soon as I logged in, they knew who I was. They asked me immediately, I suppose, because I'd never logged in before, I'm guessing, um, that are you having any trouble with your toothbrush? And I said, why, yes, yes, I am. And I clicked it and certainly they gave me one or two options of what potential issues I could be having. Um, and then I clicked on it and I literally received an email about 10 minutes later, simply saying that they were going to mail me a new toothbrush. It arrived the next day via FedEx um, and they kept their brand promise of making sure that I didn't get any cavities. And as an example of that storyline, all of my anxieties of navigating this experience with the brand that has become a part of my life was so simple. Why am I sharing this story? While it seems really simple, a lot of what we are seeing in market and our research is showing is that brand, brands that really go the extra mile to weave themselves into the fabric of a customer's life and then work hard to stay there are the brands that win. So all of this sounds great on paper, right? Sounds great on paper on this webinar. Um, I'm sure as brand leaders, you're considering, you know, how you can make sure that this is your brand philosophy and it is fulfilled in market, but there's just one small problem. And the problem is that with every digital interaction that's happening right now, this very minute out there, the bar is being raised. Somebody is creating a new experience. Somebody is creating a new physical or digital customer experience as our worlds start to come together, right? And I guess the question now becomes, what can brand leaders do to make sure that their message is heard, that they are always in front um, of that challenge? And so we have a ton of tools at our disposal. Uh, we take a 360 degree view to content. There's all types of content um, that we have in our organizations, whether it's product information, whether it is customer service, kind of like in my example, whether it is, you know, uh, how many times you've logged into an experience to empower that personalization. There are all facets of this that are actually creating the emotion for consumers in market. And so let me, let me pause here um, and take a quick poll we have our data, but I'd love to poll the audience to get, get a perspective from everyone that's attending today. Which of these do you find the most challenging in your organization? Let me see if I can um, get this open here. And which of these do you find the most challenging? Is it having consistent brand assets across channels? Is it the right brand assets to drive conversion? Um, and you know, one of the thing that we, things that we keep discussing is a little bit about personalization and engaging audiences further. Um, more and more organizations are trying to get, um, have their systems, technologies, experiences perform at a higher level. Um, global organizations are struggling with making sure that their brand experiences are the same across geographies, maybe some with nuances in different geographies. Um, and so those are a little bit of the, the trends that we see. 
Um, and I, it seems like we're getting a lot of in, uh, feedback on consistency of brand assets and personalizing experiences. Um, and so we'll, we can keep the poll open and keep going. We'll come back to it too. Um, our research showed that, you know, the, from our recent survey that we ran at the end of 22, um, to understand from marketing leaders and decision makers, what must brands do to evolve influence and reach? Um, a lot of what feedback you are giving through the poll is consistent with our research as well. You know, improving reach of marketing spend, develop stronger integrated plan across channels. And then the third one there that I've circled and read as well, which is identifying and measuring um, the risks and reputation to the brand by managing those consistent brand assets across geographies, right? So um, all of this resonates, um, especially with what all of you are sharing as well. Um, just a quick uh, sidebar on personalization, since that's hot on the list and ev on everyone's mind here, but also just a little bit of what our research is showing. You know, it's a, it's a lot less to do with what you are saying and a lot more about how you are saying it and when you're saying it. So um, consumers actually resist the desire to have personalized experiences in the earlier stages of the funnel. I've seen a lot of brands that push forward the message around personalization, um, looking for creating these personalized experiences earlier on when a consumer is considering purchase. Um, and our data is showing that that is when consumers actually resist it. Uh, consumers really crave the personalization when you are further down the path, once I have cons uh, converted as your customer, once I am receiving that tooth, the, the refill for my toothbrush every, every quarter, I'm looking for you as an organization and a brand that's already a part of my life to tell me where you can become maybe a wider part of my life or perhaps actually intrigue me with new products. Um, and so that's just a little bit of the continuum about personalization that's important to keep in mind. And another cut at that, which is also very interesting, is different types of products mean different things to consumers. So in financial services, generally our data is showing that consumers are resisting personalization, but maybe a lot near and dear to your hearts in B2C experiences around retail, consumers are craving personalization and are looking for more opportunities to, for you to bring products that matter to them to the surface that they might not have considered. So with all of that said, all of that background and, and you know, my, my, my story around the, the toothbrush is just sort of like bringing all of this full circle. What are, what are some, some of the major overarching arching themes for this year? Um, the first piece that, that's very important to just summarize here is one brand everywhere, consistent experience, there's no question that this is an ex a very important piece in market. Right now, it has been for a while, and it has become even more important. All brand leaders that I touch with, uh, touch base with, and all of our data is showing that marketing and brand very focused on a consistent, not fragmented brand experience. And conversely, our consumer data is showing the exact same thing. Once they place trust in a brand, they want to know that that brand, for some level, has their back, and more importantly, is going to give them an experience that matters. Uh, the next section, which is around content teams efficiency. Look, it's, uh, you, you all are experiencing this every day, I'm sure of it, but brand leaders, marketing leaders, even digital leaders are being tasked with delivering and market content experiences that matter with shrinking budgets, shrinking teams. Uh, teams are being expected to perform at a higher level. Um, things that I constantly hear are the ability to use systems and technologies further. Where can things like templates really make a difference in market? How can you use that to reach not only the consumer who is buying the toothbrush at the beginning, but staying a part of their journey, maybe when they're going through a support cycle or when you're trying to upsell a product? All of these can leverage different types of templates and mechanized tools within your systems to get that reach. Uh, and the final piece that I'll leave you on is time to market. You know, product information being centric, being in time, in market in a timely fashion, 
and having that content distribution be there for the customer when they need it most, that's, you know, that has become paramount for teams now. And I think the thing that's really driving this from every, all of my interactions on a weekly basis with our clients, um, with all of our technologies that we support is it's the systems and the technologies that you select and time is of the essence. So digital asset management is a core function now of providing those content experiences in market through rich media. Um, so I leave you with that. Um, Max, maybe I'll turn it back over to you. You know, I'd love to hear from you a little bit more on, you know, is, are these themes resonating with what you're seeing in market, what your clients are seeing in market as well? Maybe give us uh, some feedback there. Oh, I think Max might be frozen. Sorry, I might have to there you go. myself. That was the problem. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. No, I, I was just saying, uh, you know, I think this resonates very well with what we are experiencing right now in discussion with our customers. I was writing down some notes here while you were presenting, and I think it all comes down to, right, the, there's m many, many more distribution channels available nowadays, right? Uh, and come to that the opportunity to personalize more and the need to personalize more, just as you're explaining. And you need to do the constant optimization of those personalizations, right? But depending on your A-B testing, how things are going. And then in addition to this, you have to do it at a high speed, right? So everything has to go fast. You have to choose the right channels. You have to choose the right messaging. So there is a lot of challenges connected to that. And then if we add the layer of actual retaining the brand consistency all the way through this, you know, at some point it really, from our perspective at least, you, you need to come back and, and actually get help of this, at least the software to help you manage that throughout. But, uh, but I think these, these are just challenges that are facing marketeers. It's, it's coming back to, you know, how can we do more with less and how can we leverage technology in order to do so? So that resonated very well. Thank you so much, Chuck. Cool. Uh, I think we'll, we'll move on. Thank you, Chuck, again. And we'll, we'll get back to, to Chuck also for a Q&A session uh, at a later stage. Uh, but I wanted to hand it over to our next presenter, which is Sunny. Uh, and Sunny has been working with us very closely to, uh, and has been the lead analyst in creating this total impact report that uh, Forrester has done for us. So uh, Sunny will be able to tell you all about the report, of course, the methodology behind, and the results of it. So the screen is yours, Sunny. Thanks, Max. Hi, everyone. Um, let me start with uh, talking about what I've been working on with the Paperfly team in the past few months. So um, we conducted a, a, um, an analysis called Total Economic Impact. And what it is, is think of it as a business case. Essentially, it's uh, Forrester's in-house business case methodology where we evaluate uh, the impact, the you know what, how how a solution uh, enables uh, its clients' goals. So, what does it mean for you when when you read this total economic impact study or what we call TEI? So, you can use it to understand the value Paperfly brings to your organization. What are the benefits? You know, uh, what what do you get from using it? And uh, what are the costs? What is the investment or the internal effort you need to you know, put in to get to this level of benefit that's costs and uh, what are the flexibilities you gain from using paperfly so how does it set you up for future success in terms of maybe doing things faster doing things more efficiently or cheaper uh, we also consider risks so that's uncertainties around the benefits and costs how uh, your your own situation might be different from what we have analyzed in the study um, so this is a, a proven uh, framework that we use to uh, quantify and justify technology investments and the company's been doing it for over 20 years. Uh, and it, so, so it's a repeatable um, method that we, we apply across technology vendors. Now I'll just quickly go over the approach. I won't bore you with all the details, but I, what I want to highlight is uh, this study is based on real customer feedback. So we spoke with uh, 
brand and marketing professionals across four organizations to gather their experience. What's the customer journey? Uh, why did they use Paperfly? And what's been the experience since then? And what we do in the analysis stage on the kind of right hand side of the slide is we create a composite organization and that's a fictional company. It's an aggregation of all the four interviewees. Um, so, so it has characteristics of, of uh, all the people we spoke with in the interview and uh, we kind of showcase the whole customer journey and the benefits, et cetera, um, all the quantitative, quantitative and qualitative in impact of Paperfly um, using this kind of composite organization as the vessel. And in, in the case study, um, there is a, a section uh, about the quantified benefits and costs and equally uh, we, we look at the customer's feedback. So there's a bit of narrative that goes hand in hand with that um, quanti quantification as well. So as I say, we spoke with uh, interviewees from four organizations. They are uh, a, a mix of you know, brand and marketing uh, stakeholders. They, they're the kind of the key contact of pay, uh, Paperfly from the client side. Uh, managing either corporate branding, employer branding, and uh, kind of campaigns or content. Um, so it really is a mix of roles and speaks to how you know, uh, the, the different stakeholders in charge of content and, and brand and marketing, etc. And uh, these organizations come from a wide range of industries and, and also you know, organization size in, in terms of revenue. And of course, they have uh, slightly different use cases, each of them. So across um, retail branding, so that that was a like a um, kind of supermarket like retail <laughs> retail store that that that's uh, active in in the the Nordics, and uh, there was a global pharmaceutical company who uses Paperfly for employer branding and also corporate branding. Uh, there is a professional services firm that used mainly uh, Paperfly to uh, you know, kind of to en engage uh, with. Uh, potential kind of talent and in the employer branding use case and then there's another financial services firm that uses paperfly for their corporate branding purposes um so the first question we ask uh the interviewees is you know why paperfly you kind know, of what spot what were the challenges they were facing before um that sparked the the the, the kind of question or, or kind of the, the what drove them to the investment and uh what we hear is there are kind of two aspects um related to what chuck and matt just said so there is um on, on one side there's the the managing the brand and kind of uh distributing it sharing it across the the, the company in a consistent manner so um, what the interviewees say is that there's limited brand governance. Um, they either have a small or even no brand function, or it's a kind of, kind of uh, a new dedicated new new team that's uh, more more on the employee employer branding side. It's a new team that is set up, so um, they haven't got the processes in place yet, or there's no brand consistency because of legacy reasons. Maybe it's a it's a mix of kind of. Uh, different mergers and acquisitions and um, it all comes with their own baggage uh, or their own brand so so the the governance is one one thing so it, for example we've got this interview from the pharma company saying we didn't have any brand governance or brand management they had we have a brand book but no one's following it um, and what and another thing is, uh, she mentioned was that um, if, if you Look, look across all the entities and it's hard to recognize that it's one company. So there's li just really little brand consistency at that point. Um, on the other side, the other, the other kind of bucket of challenge, I, I, I would call it, is to deal with the creation of content and kind of the efficiency around that. So uh, there, there are many touch points with customers these days and for example, social media as the other call we see here. Um, so the, the channels don't stop and uh, this uh, interviewee from the professional services firm told me that um, they, they have to push out a lot of content, a lot of um, 
yeah, a lot, of, a lot of posts on social media for recruitment, especially during the kind of the peak recruitment cycles uh, for the company. And they, they often have a lot of concurrent campaigns taking place. So um, before using Paperfly, they, they found that um, small things will take them a lot of time to, to create. So, so for example, resizing asset from one channel, say LinkedIn to Twitter, um, might, might take a while in traditional software. So they, they just can't scale up support for the business if they have lots of um, campaigns going on. So for example, before Paperfly, they would never be able to work on 20 different campaigns at the same time and get the, mass, uh, get, get the assets out into market in time quickly. Um, so we, we spoke about the customer journey. We tried to understand why uh, these customers are using Paperfly. And uh, from now on, I will start to, to introduce a, a composite organization uh, alongside what the interviewees told me. So the organization, the, the, the fictional, fictional company that I use to illustrate the benefits and costs uh, is a global multi-billion uh, dollar enterprise. And it, it operates in 30 regions. And there are 68 users of Paperfly in total, and they are scattered across the global team. Uh, there are eight users in the global team. And then in each of their 30 regions, there are two users as well. And it uses Paperfly for one use case, and uh, they have rolled out 15 templates, uh, master templates over time, um, over three years. Um, uh, well, actually, a bit less than that. Uh, they, they, basically, they have 15 templates for you know, different formats of assets, whether it's video, whether it's um, kind of brochures, or social media, et cetera, et cetera. And here we have a, um, an overview of the benefits. So we try to uh, pay equal attention to both the quantified benefits, which is something that we can uh, translate into money terms, and also the unquantified benefits. So they're equally important, just some things that are not as easy to put a number on or um, the, the customers we spoke with didn't track those. Um, and I will go into them one by one. I just want to highlight that. Um, the benefits um, that we have summarized after speaking, speaking with all the interviewees, it, they, they kind of all address the problems relating to managing the brand assets, sharing it across the company, and then on the production side of things to create collateral that's on brand and um, enable teams across the organization to activate and localize the brand, uh, the, the assets. And I will talk about them in detail. So the first one, let me start with the, the one that has the biggest kind of quantified, quantifiable um, value in, in terms of, yeah, yeah, biggest value then. So it's improved asset creation efficiency. And how they do this is um, the composite achieved this by shortening their asset production times and reducing the active effort required and actually also shortening the time to market, as you see in the quote there. Um, the retail, uh, retail firms, interview he told me that time to market is obviously the biggest benefit and they have um decentralized production uh, enabling the store managers to create their own assets maybe as a flyer for the day's promotion the, the like today's deals for example uh, and basically decentralizing the production of of um, promotional assets with centralized templates that they've created in the central team uh, with all the brand, live brand rules embedded in, in the template. Um, but actually, if I take a step back and, and look at how uh, the customers achieved uh, this efficiency gain, um, the first thing is um, they are able to uh, bypass agencies. So they reduce the reliance on agencies because they have these templates set up. Uh, so. For example, interviewees tell me that they, their team used to spend up to 30% of their time in creating assets, namely in briefing agencies and reviewing their work. And that has, um, that's been slashed to 5% of, uh, of their employees' time now. Um, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing I touched on just now, there are life guidelines embedded in the templates. So as um, the content creators um, develop those assets, they, they get that 
reminder and and kind of um they can only put in what is already on like they 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 can only put in what is on brand so um naturally when it gets to the reviewer um because things are more consi consistent to start with uh, the review cycles are quicker and what it does is there there's this kind of apart from the purely operational kind of churning out creating developing assets there's also um freeing up time for people so uh what can you do with the free time so you can uh, your your teams can uh, I, for for example um work on more campaigns because um each asset development each campaign takes up less of their time or they can in, improve the uh, the quality of their messaging uh because now they have that time to kind of sit down and think what is the best way to target the, the, and, and personalize the journey and the content for the customers um so in terms of quantifying this benefit uh for the composite organization um and actually uh, this is reflected in the interviews as well um they they are able to create uh, the majority of their assets with the paperfly template so for the composite it's uh, up to 80 percent of the assets and uh, for these assets that they create using the template uh, they reduce 80 percent of their effort so that's why this uh, this benefit comes up to about 1.24 million dollars uh, risk adjusted over three years And then the second uh, quantifiable benefit is reduced agency spend. And it's kind of related to the first one, uh, mainly from, well, uh, re reducing reliance on, uh, on, on kind of outside agencies. So uh, with a template in place, the global teams and the regional teams, they can uh, create their own assets and update, make, make kind of small, small tweaks, um, changes, uh, on, on the existing assets and also localized assets for, for their particular region or country uh, without needing to go out to outside agencies. So for example, one company that I spoke with say they reallocated a six figure budget um, previously that went to uh, ag commissioning agency work. Um, what they did is um, there, there might still be a bit of um work that's commissioned uh, that that they use agencies for whether it's a very specialized uh, campaign or there's new branding or they work with either external or in in-house you know creative team creative team to set up the templates and then um and then the the content creators can use those templates from there on so um for the composite organization we have modeled we have assumed that each piece of asset will save them $200. And depending on how much content you're pre producing, that would um, that, that will impact the savings you get, of course. Um, and also as the composite rolls out templates, more and more templates over, over our modeling, kind of the three years that we model, um, the savings increases because you've got more templates, you can create more, more content uh, on your own in-house. Um, so think about for, for when you maybe read the study or think about how this benefit applies to your, your company, think about how many assets you're creating, what is, what's the average cost, um, or maybe think about you know, for different types of content, what's the cost that you're currently incurring when you develop these assets. And now we're going to the kind of brand management governance and distribution side of things. So the third benefit that I want to talk about is improved content distribution uh, with a centralized brand hub. So what, what this means is um, with um, the Paperfly brand hub, the brand team can centralize things, uh, centralize all things brand related, uh, whether it's their life brand book, whether it's assets um, that the content creators would need or even uh, assets that a general employee would use. Um, for example, an email signature that, that's branded or um, kind of their, their kind of brand voice, um, kind of brand mission, for example. So everything brand related goes into that central hub. And there is a bit of changing culture and uh, kind of culture change involved kind of uh, 
educating and kind of spreading the word that there's this new brand hub that that's where you go to find assets and um eventually uh, actually for example one one company took a few kind of they wrote up a minimum product with with the brand hub and then gradually added assets and kind of um rolled out kind of enablement programs to to make sure that employees know to go to this brand hub uh to to find anything assets that they need and in a couple of months time they they started to get um a lot of logons to the portal they get um kind of they see the download figures going up very quickly um and they actually highlighted a few features you kind know, of how the centralized brand hub enabled content distribution as well so the first thing they mentioned is the assets are all tagged so searching is very easy very fast very intuitive and so that's the kind of end user benefit and then for the kind of central team managing assets they um they are able to optimize the management and they they can kind of set uh, access and control know where things are uh, and also know whether there are existing assets already that can be leveraged can be kind of repurposed and uh, the, with, with the with the aim of making this brand hub a comprehensive brand center um so there's one aspect that we quantified uh, in terms of brand governance and consistency, and that's time savings uh, when someone across the company wants to find an asset, which they previously couldn't. So because things are centralized, it's very easy, to, uh, much more easy to find. Um, there are time savings every time uh, someone wants to find an asset. Or So imagine a scenario where Previously, they would have to email someone like, hi, do we have this asset? Oh, do, do we have something created? And then someone in the central team would have to look for it. Maybe a few exchanges between the requester and, and the central team person. So there's, um, we, we estimate there's a half an hour save for the central team person and then 15 minutes for the regional you know, employee asking for the asset. But there's more to, um, Kind of the brand consistency and adoption uh, that we didn't quantify and that's uh, what I mentioned the consistency side of things um, because it's the assets are so much e easier to find um, people are more likely to you know, uh, leverage the the portal and use the assets so for example in the pharmaceutical company uh, they mentioned we've got a thousand sign-ons every day and people really see this as the brand center they're used to you know, going onto the portal and find it easy and appealing to use. Uh, related to that is the brand adoption. And it really, um, the, this same, the same interview we told me, it's a critical tool for them to kind of scale up the brand adoption because they've got more than 5,000 or 50,000 users now, nowadays at the brand portal. And that's how they connect with uh, not just internal employees but also external agencies that they're working with and um, make sure that um, they use the assets that are on brand and if i build the next uh build out the slides so the uh the other unquantified benefits are more to do with the kind of production side of things so um we spoke about enabling uh regional teams to create their own content localize the content but also important is to maintain that gatekeeping control and paperfly makes that process easy because there's a workflow they can they can set up and um uh and and uh the assets will will get reviewed for example i think this is not in the quote but the interview told me that um they they still have to review there's still kind of a create and uh, review process for um, pushing out social media content but 60 percent of that social social media content um don't need adjusting when it's created in paperfly that's because um a is enabled by the, um by the templates but also um setting up this gatekeeping control having this process in place um the fourth unquantified benefit is actually something I touched on as well. Um, enhancing content quality, improving business outcomes. So um, to do with this is to do with freeing up time for people to focus on storytelling, focus on the more value added strategic side of their work, whether it's 
maybe for an employer branding person uh, to think about their um, talent acquisition strategy, think about employee uh, experience, or for a, a kind of a campaigns person, think about um, their kind of targeting personas, um, personalizing uh, content for the customers. So they have that uh, that room to um, think about the str strategic side of their work and improve uh, their KPIs, whatever it is. Uh, just going to quickly touch on costs as well. There is no complete analysis without the cost elements. So there are two costs. One is subscription and the other, uh, Paperfly subscription, and the other is to do with the internal efforts of implementing the solution and the kind of associated ongoing management efforts. Uh, so for, for the composite, the subscription cost started at 150K growing to 200K. Uh, per year as they roll out additional templates, but um, actually this really depends on kind of uh, many factors like uh, your organizational size, how many modules you're using, um, number of users, number of templates, max, I don't know if you have any kind of other factors you will you would consider and maybe encourage the people yeah, to I think, think I think about. you're explaining it quite well so so that's uh, you know numbers that you're showing there that was for for the composites that's kind of where we are on our enterprise packages and then we have a, a price package that scales up and down just as you're saying Sani, depending on uh, the size of the company the amount of users uh, the amount of uh, templates uh, several other factors are coming in for us it's really important that we're able to to scale uh, our pricing correctly in order to ensure that that value is is received on the other end, of course, otherwise it would be bad for business. So uh, so it it really goes up and down and it's very flexible depending on on any, everyone's needs. Yeah, and yeah, value is one thing that we talk about um, a lot in the business case, and that's why I've chosen a quote here. Just um, the the retail pers uh, retail companies interview me telling me, you know. They're pretty much happy with the value they're getting from the solution. Uh, there's high usage, uh, lots of users, and they're happy with the future direction that the product's going as well. And the next, actually, this, the, the final cost is implementation. So you need to think about you know, what functionalities you're taking, uh, you're adopting, whether it's the brand hub, how, uh, whether it's a master template, or how many of those master templates. So I've got. Um, uh, I have estimated the modeled the number of hours needed for each of these modules um, functions for the composite, and uh, try, uh, just trying to, you know, maybe think of, when when you think about your organization, think about uh, again the different factors like um, what are you prioritizing in the rollout? What functions are you adopting first, and then um, the cost and the effort in the implementation would change depending on your um, systems landscape uh, how many integrations you have what's the scale of implementation any complexities you need to think about and then in terms of ongoing costs you might want to think about um, what is your organization's brand governance maturity now nowadays how uh, and then and also the digital proficiency of the end users um, do you already have processes set up related to related to brand, related to creating content, uh, kind of all, all of that control. Um, so that will determine the ongoing management and any kind of uh, organization culture change efforts that you need to uh, include or kind of, yeah, that you need to carry out. And I think, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. So to summarize, we have a few financial metrics um, uh, for, for the, this analysis. So the return on investment for Paperfly um, for this composite organization over three years is 212% uh, with a benefit value of $1.72 million and a net benefit, net benefit present value of $1.17 million. So that's um, benefits net of costs. Um, and I want to sum up my uh, 
my discussion here with another quote from the pharmaceutical company's employer branding uh, head. So because of the time savings, the consistency in branding, uh, kind of cultivating a practice of sharing, they are now able to create uh, much more content. And this is just a really an abridged version of the TEI analysis. So if you're interested, there is the full study you can download and uh, read for yourself in the in the study. There are kind of uh, all, all the customer feedback that I've mentioned, and also um, the calculation tables that you can trace and you know, trace the math and apply your own situation uh, into the analysis. And also, there is a tool you can uh, that we develop with the Paperfly team as well. Um, so there's an ROI calculator tool. Uh, so you, you can, it's a very easy, a few inputs, and then you can get a customized ROI analysis for yourself. So I think that's it for my part, and I will hand it back to you, Max. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sunny. And uh, of course, from, from our perspective, uh, really exciting to see it and then get it black and white to the full transparency of, of the value that our solution creates, but also, of course, showing kind of the process of, of how to implement it as well. Uh, and overall, yeah, we're very excited, of course, uh, about having the report and also uh, for all of our um, potential uh, customers, prospects to be able to play around on that ROI estimator. Of course, we are very much aware uh, how important that return on investment calculation is in, in businesses today, right? Uh, we talked about having to do more for less, and I think this comes into that category of being able to do more while spending a little bit less. So we feel very confident in the return that we're providing, uh, and of course have high ambitions to continue developing that return and the value that we're providing as a strong partner to, to uh, all of our customers. So uh, yeah, really exciting to see, of course. And, and with that, uh, I'll, I'll thank you, Sunny, uh, and open, uh, we have a few minutes left on, on the session here today. So uh, happy to take any questions from the audience to uh, either Chuck or Sunny or, or myself. Uh, the easiest way is just to write into the chat box uh, and we'll, we'll pick it up from there. Uh, so if any, anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to write them down in the, in the messaging board and we'll, we'll uh, address them here uh, in, in the session now. And if there aren't any questions now, we're of course happy uh, to answer any questions at a later stage as well. From the Papier Flu side, the whole team is of course ready. Uh, to, to help you out and, and also, uh, you know, uh, Sunny is, is helpful in, in, in the case there are any questions on the methodology and, and I'm sure Chuck is able to answer some of the questions related to, to his uh, studies and, and, and uh, his uh, outlook on, on the market perspective. So uh, everyone happy to, to answer and I see that uh, there is limited engagement on the chat, which uh, shows me that it's at least in Europe a little bit later in the day. So uh, I think uh, if we don't get a, a big shout out now, I, I will thank both uh, you, Chuck, and you, Sunny. Thank you so much for participating today. And uh, Sunny, especially thanks to you for bearing with us through the process of, of setting this up. Uh, has been a pleasure. Uh, and uh, thank you for everyone attending today. Uh, wonderful to have you all here and, uh, and see you around. So uh, from the panel team here, I'll, I'll thank all of you. And, uh, and thank, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.